All right, so you see a little red dot there. That means we're recording. Can you say a few words, Joseph? Yeah. Hey guys, uh, welcome. Hopefully you get in your system. Let's well. test another mic. To set up and ready to go. Um, whatever mic you're using now is is working pretty well. It's a bit loud, but that's okay. I can adjust my own volume. Okay, we're using a speaker, and that's why we're trying to see. Yeah, we're trying to hook up a speaker to a Mac. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so Chris and Philip to get you a Yeti. <laughs> yeah, they need to. Whoever's microphone you're using is working really well right now. What? Somebody's, is it mine? Joseph, can you say something? Hiya. Ready to rock and roll when you guys are. Yes, again. Hello, 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 hello. Test one, two, three. I can sing too if you want me to.
Eric, you're frozen in time right now. Okay, we are trying right. to move one Meg microphone now. It's okay, well, that sounds really clear to me. Okay. Yeah, now the connection, right now the connection is really good from our side as well. Okay, excellent. Shall we go ahead and begin and then we'll just see how it works? Yes. Yeah. Again, it is being recorded, um, so even if you have a bad connection at some point, my voice and the PowerPoint will still be recorded. Um, and I'll put the link up like I did last week um, into the session notes on on Moodle. Um, again, just to, and sorry, I haven't. There's a couple readings that I said I would get to you. Our our scanner is not working. I've tried it twice now, and when it comes to my email, it's all just lots of letters and numbers and things. So we're working on our scanner. Um, again, if you manage to get a copy of Gonzalez's uh, uh, book, Story of Christianity, that would be really helpful. Um, if not, I'm still going to try again. The readings for this week are up there. Um, the Bedinson one is uh, uh, Benedict's Rule, um, which we will talk about this morning. And then the other one is kind of an, an introduction to medieval church history, uh, which again, it scanned in a weird kind of a way. One is facing up, the next one's facing down. One's facing up, the next one's facing down. So sorry about that. Um, what else? Again, highlight, I'll, I'll do a, a few more mini lectures later today from whatever we don't cover, things that I'd like you to, to know. Um, if you would have a look at those throughout the week. And I would also highlight again the forum. So I did have one person ask a question. Thank you very much. Um, oh, I've got two. Well, at 8.59. Thanks, Eric. Um, I will I will get to that one as soon as I can, but uh, I did have a, a nice question here about understanding our our culture and our context. It's a really really poignant question, um, so well done for you uh, for asking that one. So have a look at that question if you haven't yet, and have a look at my response. And uh, good thinking on that one. And Eric, I'll get to yours later on today. Um, I've got another chat here for medieval. Oh, I've already got one. Well done. So we'll have a look at these, and uh, I'll respond to them, and maybe I'll give you some answers. I haven't looked at that one yet, but maybe you'll get some answers today. Here we go. Let's put our PowerPoint up, and let's say a prayer, and then we'll get going. Father, thank you again for a new week. Uh, thank you for uh, a time change, and thank you that we're both time changing at the same time. Um, we pray that uh, you'll be with us as we gather this morning. And as we learn about how your church grew and developed over the next thousand years, uh, may we be attentive and receptive, and may whatever we do here find its feet in the church. Through Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Okay, everyone. Um, just to recap, just briefly, I did cover a few things that we didn't get to talk about in the lecture, in those mini lectures. I hope you were able to see those. Um, one thing that we didn't get to talk about, which I might at some point... Uh, maybe face to face, but one of the questions that's always asked about the early church is how did the church grow and spread, especially if if they're being uh, if they're afraid of persecution, um, and especially if they are not not a key religion in the empire. So how did they grow and spread? Um, there's a number of different theories of why this took place, and um, some of them uh, there's one book, a fantastic book on house churches. And it suggests that it's actually the the women, um, Christian women, who are one of the reasons why the church grew and spread, because women were the head of the household um, in the Roman civilization, and they took care of business there. And so if the churches are meeting at homes, then who's in charge? The lady of the house. Um, really good book on house churches. Um, another one, a sociologist has uh, put together, his name is Rodney, Rodney Stark, um, he's got a few ideas of, of how it grew and spread, and his are more sociological. Um, again, I, you know, you can read those in the notes. I think I put, put ugh, I think I put a few of those in the notes. But a recent one that I've come across is called the the patient ferment of the early church. And Crider, this is uh, Alan Crider's book. Um, it just came out this year, and. He suggests that one of the reasons why Christianity was so successful is because of, if you read the New Testament letters, particularly ones that 
um, that Peter wrote to the church. He talks about um, uh, getting on with your daily business, just living a quiet life. Um, let the gospel be uh, seen in, in how you live it rather than how you speak it. And so if people see you living a good life and um, and loving one another, loving your neighbor, then they might actually come to a point where they're asking you a question and say, well, why do you live like this? And we see some of the evidence of this even in emperors who were saying, um, why do these Christians help these people who they don't even know? Uh, well, it's because that's what the gospel calls us to do. So he calls it the patient ferment of the church. Um, the church just patiently lives out um, the Christian faith amongst each other, and then that spreads out into the world. Um, so just a, a few books. If you're ever interested in uh, you know, church planting and church growth in the early church, uh, Rodney Stark, Alan Kreider, and um, I can't remember the name of the lady uh, who wrote the other book. Oh, Isaac is her name, um, on house churches. And I'll try and put links to those, like to Amazon, if you want to have a look at those later. So we're moving into medieval period. Uh, most historians, they, they church historians, they break church history into like 500-year segments. Um, so early church we see is the first 500 years uh, of the church around to 451. There was a key council called the Council of Chalcedon, which took place at that point. And the medieval uh, church, we we look at basically up to around Charlemagne, which is 800, so it's not quite 500 years. You could go up to 1,000 because at, at 1054, we have an east and a west church split, which we'll talk about this morning. Um, and then you move another 500 years, and by the time you get to 1500, you've got Protestant Reformation. And now we're about 500 years gone from the Protestant Reformation. So questions that we have to think about for today is... Joseph, could yes. you please hold for a second? Okay, yep. Because we cannot um, uh, hear you. The problem is that uh, there's always interruptions in between, and uh, it's really impossible to follow what you're trying to tell us. Hmm. So either please take a break and, and wait, or I don't know what right. other options there would be. But um, every like second or third word is cut off, so it's impossible to follow you. Sorry about that. I don't. The know reception. Okay. <coughs> okay. Seems like not all of us have these issues, but uh, most of us. Okay, we try to uh, get the sound from another laptop. Um, I'm just going to speak a sentence really quickly and s tell me if there's any breaks in this one. I've just made a slight adjustment to the microphone. Am I having any breaks as I talk now? Now it's fine, Joseph. Through my laptop, it's working fine. So go ahead. Okay. I think there's an auto-adjust uh, setting in video, auto-adjust microphone, which I've just taken off. So now it shouldn't auto-adjust at all. Um, it should be straightforward. Is that better? If someone says continue, I'll, I'll continue. Continue. Right. All right. So we'll, we'll keep going. Um, church historians break up church history typically in 500-year periods. Um, early church, Jesus, to about 451, which is a, a certain council called Chalcedon. 451 to about 1,000. Uh, 1054 is a, a time when the Eastern Church and the Western Church uh, went two different ways. Um, five. 500 years later, in 1500, we have what's called the Protestant Reformation, um, where, of course, you know, we'll talk about that one next week, but that was quite a significant change in the church. And now we're about 500 years gone from the Protestant Reformation. So it's an interesting question to ask ourselves um, about the world in which we live. Are we in some kind of a 500-year shift? Are we in some kind of a change uh, today? We will talk more about that when we look at the Reformation. Um, but before we get there, we have to look at the medieval church. And so many students ask, why study medieval history 
uh, let's get to the Reformation. That's where it all happens. That's where the action takes place. And you may have heard the phrase Dark Ages used um, for this period in the church. Um, I'm, I'm hoping that that's not a phrase that you use, but if you do, I'm hoping to change your mind on that one. Um, some people say that nothing good happened. It was a time period when popes and emperors ruled with an iron fist, uh, when Islam took over much, much of the Christian world, when Christianity responded in what we call the Crusades, taking up the sword, giving the battle cry, God wills it, um, archaic, barbaric, narrow-minded, uneducated people. They were illiterate, and as such, they did whatever the church or the authority, the Pope said. I mean, that's a perception that many people have of medieval Christianity. However, um, I hope throughout this lecture, and then as you uh, continue your reading and, and watching the, the mini lectures, there are lots of good things that took place during medieval period. And there are a number of things that are actually formative in how we understand the Christian faith today. Um, which had their genesis in the medieval period. Um, slide, here we go. This gentleman here is called Emperor Constantine. And <clears throat> this is actually an image, or a, yeah, an image of a statue of Constantine, which is in York uh, in England. And the reason it's there is he was, um, in some sense, stationed as a military leader in Britain uh, at the time when he found out um, that he was asked to become emperor and so we got a statue of him in York. Um, Constantine's his motives can be debated, the effect of his policy, um, it transformed Christianity. So here, here's what happened with Constantine. Um, he became emperor and he's, he's a pagan emperor as all the other ones were and Christianity was illegal at the time in the empire. It wasn't necessarily a widespread systematic persecution of Christians, but it was illegal uh, to be a Christian. And he's going to battle uh, with two other people, uh, two other groups who were fighting to become emperor. And he's going to battle at a place called Milvian Bridge. And the night before battle, he has a dream, a vision, whatever you want to call it, where he saw um, he saw him going to battle and behind him were all of these angels. And these angels um, were, were holding things that were in the shape of a cross. And he was told, um, you can see, maybe you can see if you look really closely at, under his feet, Constantine, by this sign, conquer. So he, he heard this voice that said, by the sign conquer. The sign that they're talking about is the cross. So the next day, he had his soldiers put a cross onto their shields, and they went into battle at Milvian Bridge, and he wins, and he becomes the emperor. Um, the question is, was this a conversion moment? Did he suddenly believe in this man called Jesus Christ? Did he believe in the resurrection? Um, we don't know, because, of course, we don't know Constantine's heart. But the significant thing that took place is he then, within a couple of years, legalized Christianity. Once you legalize Christianity in the empire, and it's a mandate from the emperor, what then happens to Christianity in the empire? Anyone? Can't hear you. You have to unmute one of your microphones. Habish. Yeah, yeah you, you speak here for a second. There you go. Yeah, no, it's, I mean, it can finally grow, finally expand out in the open, and finally not be in house <laughs> yeah, mute, mute the other microphones in the room. You can only use one, um, otherwise, they'll pick up feedback. Go ahead, sorry. If you can. Yeah, I can't hear you. Yeah, I see a new person there. Um, I, I can't hear anyone speaking. Sorry. Yeah. All right, now I can hear someone. Yeah. Go ahead. You, can you hear? 
Yes, I can hear now. Try it one more time. Okay. So For the third time. Stop being underground. It can finally move forward and just really become part of the institution that we see it today. Is it wasn't in house churches. It wasn't people being secretive. It wasn't just. It could finally grow. Yes. Exactly. That's exactly right. Um, no longer are we persecuted. The the leader of our empire has now embraced who we are. Um, for good or for ill, um, there's lots of debates about Constantine and his faith, um, but for whatever personal reasons, he legalized Christianity, and Christianity soon became um, a public-facing thing. Now, if you're a Christian in the early church, and all of a sudden the emperor changes the game, and you go from being uh, a person in hiding to um, part of the, as you were saying, the establishment, that can really mess your mind up. Um, now, you're already struggling trying to define what it, who Jesus is. You're already struggling trying to put together what it means to worship Jesus um, coming out of the Jewish faith that says, have no other gods before me. You're trying to figure out what it means that Jesus came back to life. You're, you don't yet have what we call the Bible. Um, you have letters going around. You have what we call the Old Testament. You have uh, some Gospels uh, popping up, but you've got some that aren't very good. You've got some that are very good. Um, you have some with an agenda, some without. Um, we will talk about these as we look at the theology section of, um, of the course. But... Christians uh, at the time of Constantine are now hit with all kinds of new questions. What does it mean to be a part of the establishment? What does it mean to be um, to have the side of the of the emperor? What does it mean to now see buildings um, dedicated to Jesus as you walk around? Uh, what does it mean to see crosses everywhere, uh, whereas before we had to have uh, secret symbols? Uh, what does it mean? To um, to see a a bishop of Rome become now one of the leading figures in politics and society. So everything really changes when Constantine legalizes Christianity. So the new center of Roman life um, was Rome, and not too long after this, Constantine decided to build a city dedicated to himself, as emperors often do. And so he built a city um, in modern-day Turkey called Constantinople. Um, you may have heard of that name before. It has a new name now. It's called Istanbul. Um, so Istanbul used to be called Constantinople, and it was a Roman uh, Empire city. And the idea was that we've got a center of Christ uh, our center of the empire in the west, in Rome, but our empire spreads far east. So Constantine wanted to put a center of um, the empire, empire in the east, and that's what Constantinople was built to be. I'm sure we'll see a map soon uh, as we move through this stuff, but um, if you don't know where Istanbul is, there's uh, the Black Sea, which uh, connects the Mediterranean um, to what we call modern day, you know, Russia, Kazakhstan, um, places uh, over that direction. And Constantinople is... Uh, kind of the gateway between those. It's a center of trade. It's a connection between the East and the West. It is a key place geographically. And so Constantine decided, I'm going to build a city there. Now, he also moved himself there. Here's a key uh, challenge with this one. In the West, people spoke Latin by this time. In the East, people were still speaking Greek. This plays a significant role in how the church grew and developed because you have one side of the empire speaking Greek, and you have the other side of the empire speaking Latin. Um, translations of the Bible now um, are being developed as we move forward. A, there's a Greek New Testament, obviously. There's a Greek, um, a, a Greek translation of the whole Bible of the Old Testament called the Septuagint, which is being used. But a guy called Jerome in the 5th century translates the Bible into Latin, and this is a significant development. Um, Jerome's Latin Vulgate, is its name, becomes the official um, 
translation of, of the Bible, once the Bible is uh, canonized, once it's put together as we know it today, um, the Latin translation becomes the key translation. And this is really significant for the Eastern Church who wanted to continue using uh, Greek. I'm going to move forward a bit. Constantine, big shift. Um, we will talk a little bit more about these people uh, when we move to the theology section. Um, but for the first, again, first 300, 400 years in the early church, they're trying to develop an understanding of who God is in light of Jesus. Jesus changes the game. Um, so these are Irenaeus, Tertullian, and Origen. Um, heresies. Have you heard of the word heresy before? Probably. So orthodoxy means right teaching and heresy. Heresy literally means a, a party, so a, a group who think a different way in this case. Um, but uh, anyway, heresy is the opposite to orthodoxy. Um, Gnosticism, just in brief, Gnostics uh, believe that the physical world, the material world is bad and that the spiritual world is good. And there's a, a secret knowledge that uh, Gnostics had. Um, gnosis is the Greek word for knowledge. And if you had this secret knowledge, then you could, um, you know, be, I don't know, saved. I'm, I'm trying to translate here because there's a lot of work you have to do to understand Gnosticism. Um, Arianism. So a, a Christian called Arius I was trying to figure out who Jesus is. And... He made the statement that um, there was a time when Jesus wasn't, and when he does that, it, it the implication is that Jesus was a created being, and uh, that was condemned as a heresy because Jesus um, is understood as being eternal, uh, uncreated. Um, Apollinarianism, that uh, so Jesus. Um, again, all of these are with Jesus. Jesus, um, he didn't assume a human mind, so everything about Jesus was, was human, um, but his mind was divine. His mind was different. It wasn't 100% uh, human. Nestorianism, uh, there was a phrase being used in the Greek church called theotokos, which means mother of God when they're talking about Mary. And Nestoria said we can't we can't say that she's the mother of God because that makes her divine, um, and so they were suggesting to call her something different, um, and the reason was uh, Jesus' humanness and his divineness were not connected; um, they were two separate things. And then Eutychianism said that Jesus only had one nature. Um, a, a, a divine nature. So that's some uh, some heresies, and then the way that we counteract heresy is through councils. We get a group of people together, and we decide what is orthodoxy and what is not. So there's a few key councils there, uh, which you can read in the early church notes. Some fur further developments in theology. Um, we have Cyprian, uh, Jerome. Um, there's a quote from uh, Gonzalez, I think. Jerome was given was to give the Middle Ages its greatest book, the translation of the Bible into Latin. Ambrose, uh, so that's Jerome. Here is uh, Ambrose, Bishop of Milan, who uh, really took to heart this, this power that the bishop could have in politics. Um, his story is really fascinating. He's in the, the early church notes as well. And I've, I did a little mini lecture on Augustine, um, who really does shape Western uh, thinking, Christian thinking. Ecclesiology, um, we'll just go quickly through that. Church architecture, this is another big shift. Um, ecclesiology is simply how you organize your church, and things started to change. Uh, for, through the first let me go back to that one. Through the first 400 years of the church, they're trying to decide how do we organize ourselves? How do we structure ourselves? How, what kind of authority do we have? And by the time Constantine, Constantine comes around, legalizes Christianity, you have a bishop who is um, responsible for a, a city, uh, a geographic area, and connected to the bishop are um, deacons and presbyters. 
you could translate that as uh, pastors, presbyters. And so this was kind of the, the um, uh, uniform way of organizing ourselves across the empire. So once Christianity is legalized, now these bishops automatically have a certain level of power um, because they're responsible for Christianity in those cities. So bishops quickly become um, an authority, both politically and religiously. Church architecture, right? So we were talking about how um, we Christians were meeting in uh, in homes. Um, they couldn't have the outside of their buildings have any kind of an indication that this was a place of worship to Jesus. And so this is just one example of how a house church may have been organized. Um, this is called Kafar Athne. Um, it's in Megiddo, and it was a little chapel on the side of uh, a Roman soldier's home, who was a Christian. And the significance of this building is there's a table in the middle of the room, and there's mosaics on the floor, which represents uh, gospel stories and biblical stories. But now we move to purpose-built, massive buildings dedicated to Jesus. So this is one of the early, the, the Roman word is called basilica. And this is one of the earliest basilicas dedicated to um, the worship of Jesus of the Roman Empire. This is an outline of the uh, Church of St. John uh, in Lateran. This is in Rome as well. And as you can tell, when your buildings start to look like this and they're not in homes, there's a shift in your thinking as well. We now are powerful. You can just think of it that way, simply put. Uh, we're no longer persecuted. We're no longer in hiding. We are now a part of the establishment. We are now um, in power. And Christians really struggled with this because Jesus, his whole ministry was challenging power, uh, challenging the principalities and powers of the world, challenging the structures of both religion and society. And now all of a sudden, 400 years later, or 300 and something years later, you have Christians who are a part of the establishment. Um so for many people, Constantine is a, is a bad character. Legalizing Christianity actually was detrimental to the church um, because the church soon began to lose its identity of patient ferment, you know, of, of living in exile, of, of awaiting Jesus' return, and of seeing him as king rather than uh, any earthly authority as king. So another thing that we didn't um, – I, I mentioned just briefly – I think in a mini lecture about monasticism. Um, this is St. Anthony, and he represents this individualist um, hermit, is, is the English word, um, version of monasticism where you separate yourselves. Uh, a reaction to persecution, one reaction was monasticism. And instead of being persecuted, let's run away out into the desert and we will battle um, spiritual battles. Um, for Jesus. Pacomius is the next character um, who represents the early communal monasticism where um, people would gather together. These monks all have a shared way of living and he wrote um, one of the earliest monastic rules of if we're all going to live together this is the way we're going to live together. Then we have Basil um, who lived in uh, what's called Cappadocia, which again is modern-day Turkey. And he represents an Eastern communal monasticism, and he wrote an early rule as well. And what he did is um, he wrote a rule for all of it. He was a bishop, and he wrote a rule for all of his pastors. So he said, if you're going to be under my leadership, you are going to live um, under this kind of a rule. And it's a communal-type monasticism. And then this is John Cassian, who was one of the key church leaders who went and visited all of these different forms of monasticism in the desert, in Syria, and in Cappadocia. He takes it back to the West, influences Augustine, who uh, developed his own way of living for his uh, pastors under his care as bishop. There's Augustine. Right. I'm going to try to play this video for you, the rise and fall of the Roman Empire and the spread of Christianity in Europe. Um, these are like some time-lapse videos that kind of 
show you in color um, the the uh, two things that you see there. So let's let's try this. This is the history of the Roman Empire in video form. So moving forward, they start to conquer all of the Med. Now we get to Jesus' time, most of southern Europe most of Northern Africa. You see the East and the West split. The West fell. We'll talk about that. And then the Empire starts to be conquered by Islam. So no longer is the Empire in Northern Africa. And it begins to be conquered by the north. So the empire shrunk in some sense. And now by the time we get to the Middle Ages, there's not much of any Roman Empire anymore. So quickly do things change. You go from ruling the world to dwindling into nothing. Now that you've got that in your mind, let's look at how Christianity spread into Europe and see if you can see the similarities in those two videos. So Jesus, first century, look at that. Now that Christianity and the empire at 300 are basically joining together, Christianity is spreading all over Europe, up into the British Isles, all over Northern Africa, over into Asia, and then check this out, the rise of Islam. And we will talk about this. So the green... Islam was uh, quite quickly spreading in Northern Africa and the Middle East. Christianity then started to make its way into Northern Europe and into China, actually. We, we rarely hear about that. And as you see in the West, Christianity basically takes over all of Western Europe and the Mongolians had the largest empire in the world at one point. And Christianity then isolates itself, pretty much. And then we have missionaries go to what was called the New World, South America, North America. And Islam begins to spread southwards in Africa. And there you are. So I found those maps really helpful. You've got the link in the PowerPoint, and you can go and watch those again for yourself at some point. Um, but I, I really did see those as really helpful to see both how the empire grew and spread, and then how it coalesced with the spread of Christianity as well. And then when you get in this particular map, the green come up, you see uh, the rise of Islam and how much of an effect that had on uh, on Christianity, particularly in Northern Africa. Um, and then in the Middle East as well. So let's move forward a little bit, setting the scene. This is from A Concise History of the Medieval Church by a guy called Frank. And he says that medieval Christianity in Europe was transmitted and shaped by new peoples, along with the Celts and the extreme West and the Slavs in the East. The various German tribes were particularly significant here. In the course of a large-scale movement, the historical details of which can no longer be ascertained, uh, and which is simply referred to as the migrations. 
from the first century onwards. These tribes had come within uh, the horizons of the Greco-Roman world. Um, are you seeing that quote yet? Has it popped up yet? Okay, it's on its way. Um, it's on my screen, but it'll be on yours in just a moment. Anyway, all of that to say that as you've seen there, with the uh, rise of the Roman Empire, then the um, joining of Christianity to, to Rome, you see the spread of Christianity, but then you have from the north um, uh, conquering peoples, uh, the Slavs, um, the, uh, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? Well, the German, Germanic tribes um, were coming to, to take over the empire from the north. You have the rise of Islam from the east, <clears throat> as well as people like the Huns, um, who, who were coming from the east as well. And ultimately, you saw the empire shrink into a small little thing. Now, this is a world in which, particularly in Western Europe, that's where we're going to spend most of our time. Um, this is a world in which um, it was a scary world. Um, you were always in fear of who was going to be taking over you next. Um, once the empire starts to fold, starts to crumble, um, you no longer have that piece of Rome that we talked about in the first lecture, the Pax Romana, where there was free trade, free travel, you're protected by soldiers. If you're a Roman citizen and you got in, into a problem, you could uh, seek the help of, of Rome. But things quickly began to change. Um, and you were no longer um, protected would be the key word. So if we look at, um, let's move forward a bit. Just going to skip through some of this stuff. You'll you'll be able to go back and read it um, later. Let's look at this map here. So at the end of the fourth century, the historical focus was the Mediterranean Sea and the lands of the Roman Empire um, along its entire area. Um, its southern boundary was the Sahara Desert. The northern boundary was Hadrian's Wall, which is in this country. Um, <clears throat> and along the Rhine and the Danube from the North Sea to the Black Sea. So it covered most of what we now call Europe. Um, in 410, invaders from the north, these are Visigoths, sacked Rome and the Empire. And it was known, as it was known in the ancient world, it fell. Um, and now, as I was saying, when the Empire falls, and the church is now, in some sense, married to the empire. Christianity, again, is having to raise questions about who are we? What's our identity? Where is our authority? Well, in some sense, um, the nice thing for Christians were they were the only stability in the empire. Even though the political and the, um, the kingship, the emperor, is no longer in control. There is a a European wide network called the Church, who weren't necessarily, um, you know, killed, taken over, and whatnot. So here's what happened when Constantine built his city. Um, if you can look closely on the map, you see that word on the right side, Byzantine Empire. Um, there's Constantinople. There's that little city there, which connects the Aegean Sea or the um, uh, whatever sea that is that the Aegean Sea. Anyway, whatever sea connects to the Mediterranean to the Black Sea, which is there on the right. That's where Constantinople is. When Constantine moved his uh, basically his his throne to Con when Constantine moved his throne to Constantinople, um, you then have a power vacuum in the West. When the emperor leaves Rome and goes to another city far, far away, who's then going to be in charge of Rome? That's a question for you to think about. If there's a power vacuum in Rome, who can, who can fill that vacuum? Well, Christina just said, can you hear me? She said the Pope. All right. So he wasn't called Pope yet, but you are correct. So the Bishop of Rome, the leader of the church in Rome, now has a, an opportunity 
and in some cases a, a necessity, to fill this power gap, which was left by Constantine, who went to the east. And so with the leaving of Constantine, the building of Constantinople, you now have an opportunity for the Bishop of Rome to then become a very powerful uh, political and religious figure. And in many ways, the Pope, as we now call him, became the leader of politics and religion in Rome. Very significant, this. Um, Constantinople, again, changes everything. You have um, a leader of the church in Constantinople that Constantine set up, and you have a leader of the church in Rome called the Bishop of Rome, now called the Pope. So you have two key leaders of the church. You still have one church. You still have one empire in the 4th century. But once Constantine leaves, 410, Rome gets sacked. Um, the power gap that was left um, is now obviously overtaken by the Goths from the north. But in terms of the church, the Pope still had the power in the west. Um, let's move forward. This person here is called Theodoric. And Theodoric was uh, what we would now call German. Um, the coming of the Germans posed serious issues for the Catholic Church. When these peoples entered the empire, none of them were Catholic. They were either Aryan or pagan. So we mentioned Arius earlier. And Arius didn't believe in the full divinity of Jesus. So um, his version of Christianity made its way north. Um, before the fall of Rome. And so those who became Christians in what we now call Germany were actually Arians. And Arian simply means it's connecting you to a person called Arius. It's not Arian in the way that we might think of Arius or Arian in um, Hitler's day. It's not the same thing. Um, Arian became a generic term for German people. But what it historically actually means is you're connected to a theological identity which says Jesus wasn't fully divine. That's what Arian, Arianism actually is. Um, so Theodoric was king of the Ostrogoths who ruled uh, what's now Germany. And um, he's, he's really significant because, if I remember correctly, yeah, he was tolerant of of orthodoxy. So even though he was Arian, um, which is technically a heresy, uh, he allowed those who weren't Arian um, to live within his within his empire. Um, if we move forward a bit, let me go to Ulfius. Right, so Ulfius. This figure here was part Greek and part Goth, and he translated the Bible into Goth. And it's the first time we have a translation of the Bible that's not Hebrew, Greek, or Latin. And this is really significant. Um, we'll look at this again as we look at the Reformation, but translating the Bible into languages of the people is really important. Um, it changes how Christians can understand who God is. It changes how the church can understand how to structure and organize themselves. Um, and it also shapes how certain peoples um, uh, understand Christianity and, and what Christianity looks like um, for them. We'll particularly see this as we move into the Reformation when um, Martin Luther and others uh, translated the Bible into their own, own languages. Now, the process of Christianization extended over a period of around a thousand years, which you saw in that map, that video. It took a long time to do this. It wasn't like Islam um, that we'll see. With Islam, it was really quick. Um, Islam conquered Northern Africa and Middle East within less than 100 years. Like This thing was really fast. And it was based on a mandate which said convert or kill. Um, and, and that's one of the reasons why Islam spread so quickly. With Christianity, it was a lot different. It was a lot more complex. And there were a lot of... Um, uh, it, it wasn't like there were missionaries who went to spread the gospel. Um, we'll talk about how conversion often came with the conversion of the leader of a, of a tribe or a group of people. Um, that vacuum left by the fall of the Roman Empire meant that you now have powers 
all across Western Europe. And uh, people like Boethius and people like Ulfius and people like Theodoric are different leaders of groups of people um, in, in Western Europe. And so for Christianity to be to spread into these places, it usually took the form of if you can convert the local leader or the king or the tribe leader, um, whatever they were called, if you can get them on board, then the rest will follow suit. Um, so the strongest argument used by missionaries when they spoke to kings and tribal leaders was that the Christian God was more powerful and more effective than the one that they had been worshipping. And so a God who could deliver uh, victories and children and wealth was the God to choose. Um, so primitive, archaic religion. Um, again, this is an agrarian society. Um, farms, vegetation. Um, this is how Western Europe really was. Um, that's how people made their money, and that's the way of life. You, uh, a, a group or a system of, of uh, power began to be developed called the feudal system, which you may have heard about before, where you have a, a lord over who's a landowner, and because you, have, you don't have this piece of Rome anymore, you would gravitate to whoever was the strongest landowner, landowner near you, and you would seek them for your protection. So you would work for them, you'd become their servant in some sense, and in response they would, they would protect you. And that was the way of life um, in this really chaotic environment uh, called medieval Europe. Um, the conversion of a kingdom, what did it look like? Well, often it looked like whatever the king wanted it to look like. Um, I'll talk a little bit about, we'll get there here in a minute, called, uh, this is one of my favorite books. Um, it's by a guy called The Venerable Bede. It's called The Ecclesiastical History of the English People. And it's the, it's the earliest uh, history that we have of how Christianity came to the British Isles and Ireland and, and how it spread and how it grew and developed. Um, he was a monk, and he, he took a long time to do this. And one of his uh, uh, identifying marks of his work is that he wasn't he had no agenda. He was doing his best to just be a historian and tell the story as he had heard it from the various peoples that he met. Um, so anyway, he gives some first-hand accounts of how uh, kings and tribal leaders were convinced of Christianity and became and, and made their tribe a Christian tribe. Um, so we will talk about him a bit more later. Um, by the time we get to... Let's see here. No, I'm going to skip something. Let's have a look at monasticism really quickly. Here we go. This is one of your readings. So in this chaotic world that we're living in, uh, where there's power struggles and there's worry of uh, who is who's going to be in charge next and um, am I connected to the right feudal lord? And um, I don't know if I'm going to be conquered. I don't know if, if my land is going to produce well enough for this lord to continue protecting me. It's just it's a world of chaos. Um, there were a couple of things that were um, that were that weren't as affected by that. One of them was the um, the established uh, the establishment of Christianity, and by that I mean priests bishops, you know, those who are in the, the clergy, so to speak. Um, and the other one was the monks. So you learned a little bit about desert monasticism, and there's different forms of monasticism. Well, in the West, um, a guy called Benedict of Nursia develops a, a rule by which Western monks gravitated. And most of Western um, developments and organization of monasticism attributes their understanding and their way of life to Benedict of Nursia. Um, he's a 6th century uh, person and uh, he has a biography written about him by one of the popes called Gregory the Great in 593 
um, just a little bit over 40 years after Benedict died. Um, we have some, I mean, the word hagiography, I may have mentioned this before, um, it, think of biographies that embellish the truth a bit. So this work was saying things like, you know, Benedict did miracles and stuff like that. Maybe he did, maybe he didn't. Um, but that's what Gregory says about him. He attributes miracles to Benedict. He made water flow from rocks, for example. Um, and then he talks about how he founded a, founded a monastery in uh, Monte Cassino, which is a hill above the town um, of Cassianum near Naples. So we're talking about Italy here. Um, he's most famous for writing down this rule, um, a rule for monks to live. And the key unique thing about Benedict's rule is that it emphasizes both the communal and the individual aspects of monasticism. So with the St. Anthony um, in the second century, you have an individual version of monasticism where you, um, you're you ascetic, you, you give up the benefits of life, you give up the good things of life, you go out by yourself and you live off very little and you battle with Satan and with the powers. With Pacomius, you live with a group of people and you're all uh, in this together and everything you do is to benefit the group of people. Same thing with Basil as well and with Augustine, but with Basil and Augustine, theirs were designed for clergy, so their rule of life was something that was lived out in the world, not necessarily one that you removed yourself from the world. And so Benedict's rule um, is bringing together of the individual benefits of monasticism and the communal benefits of monasticism and the openness to anyone to join. The only uh, criteria you had to meet to join uh, the monastic order is that you will devote your life to this way of living. And if at any point you renege on that devotion, there's lots of rules um, which which ultimately can kick you out. But one of the beautiful things about Benedict is there are redemptive rules. So even if you did something that's contrary to the rule, there were ways of being redeemed back into the community. Um, the rule emphasizes and promotes the balance between the spiritual growth of each monk, so the individual, and the general peace and well-being of the community. Discipline proves to be one of the chief attractions of Benedictine monasteries in this age of lawlessness. Okay, So one of the reasons that um, people like Benedict were successful and his rule was successful is it brought order in the middle of chaos. So you could send your child to a monastery and know that they would be fed, that they would be educated, that they would be protected, that they would be cared for, that um, they would learn a trade, and ultimately that they would um, uh, benefit Christianity as a whole, and they would be living a holy life. So one of the reasons why monasticism became a, a, um, a growing attractive thing to join is this fact that it was being birthed into a world that was chaotic. Um, and lawless. And so that's why many people joined. If you can still hear me, <laughs> can we take a five minute break? I don't hear any alarm. There you go. I can see you now. Um, if we could take a five minute break. Yeah, Sounds great. Yeah. Thanks.
if you could start to gather back together. Go ahead and gather back together, guys. Joseph, oh, there's, there's a new face. Yes, I wanted to check if everybody's behaving. Yeah, they're behaving. <laughs> it's, it's a lot well, of listening today. I'm trying to cover about a thousand sound, years of history. That didn't sound convincing. <laughs> no, we're having a few tech problems today. Okay. No. Well, Robert is in charge of the tech, so. <laughs> I was telling him, you, you need to get them one of these. They're amazing. Oh, the Yeti. I have a, uh, I have um, a um, uh, road, uh, road mic. Yeah. I mean, so whatever the, ideal, you guys need. the ideal situation okay. would be one microphone in the classroom and put me up on a big screen and one camera looking at the class. That's the ideal. Um, don't I don't know if we you... Can put a... We couldn't hear him. I the problem. Yeah. Yeah. The sound quality was so shitty. Yeah. Like the whole time we were all just trying to hear. Okay. Yeah. So all that needs to be... <laughs> that, that feedback is there's, there's a loop that's happening where the speakers are going into the microphone and back into the speakers and into the microphone. And that's why you're getting that feedback thing. Um, the way we've been doing it for the last little while has been fine on my end. I'm just, I mean, like I said, it's a lot of listening today because I'm, I'm trying to cover so a lot of So last time you put it on the screen and, it, uh, and the sound didn't work, yeah. even though you put the sound into your computer. Mute, mute the microphone. There you go. I don't know whose mic is on. Okay, well, we have to figure something out then. If you let us know what uh, what what helps, I mean, we we should have all the settings here to to get that going. Yeah, what you're doing right now is is working perfect, and I can hear others in the room. So whatever microphone is connected to the laptop you are on right now. Would work. Okay, so this is uh, this is the MacBook uh, Raza's MacBook. Yeah. He, he says that this is fine with him. It's per, with this uh, mic, it's perfect. But I have all the equipment when it comes to a mic um, uh, right. that we can that we can use. Um, if you've got it to hand and just if it's a USB microphone, those are those work really well. And they're usually designed to to not pick up the echo. Like they know they know not to yeah, take. But, but, but they but they said that they don't hear you when they put it on here. Yeah. That's yeah. the problem. Yeah, you will need an, will need an external speaker uh, of some sort. The way I've done it before is I connect a, a laptop to a TV by HDMI. That's what we've done. That's what, okay. that's what we do. And so your sound, your sound you settings see, you should be... 
Yep. Do, I do you see, see that, this yeah. nice big TV, TV that we bought just for you? Oh, that's lovely. Thank you. Yeah, I didn't <laughs> help. <laughs> well, what needs to happen is that HDMI to that TV, you need to make sure that the sound settings in video are set to, to the speakers through the TV. Okay. So, you, they already did that. Well, we are, let's say, we are not the technical advanced people in the world. <laughs> but you're, you're, you should be efficient, though. You should, you should know how to figure things out. Yes, we, 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 we should know. We should know. But maybe we can get somebody in uh, who, can, who can help uh, solve that problem. Because that yeah. should, be a, should be solvable. So, what I mean, the way we've sense. done it for the last hour, it's been fine. Huh? Um, so if you want to keep keep in this model for the rest of today's session, okay. Um, well, I, I don't want to I don't want to interrupt too uh, too much. But uh, um, yeah, Christine said maybe uh, next week you can meet uh, an hour or half an hour earlier to test everything because we have it all. We we should have the setting uh, here. I think it's just a matter of setting it up and then being under time pressure once the the class starts. Yeah, of course. I mean, I'm I'm happy to do that. I, I actually get to the office okay. about 7:45. So, okay. so here, uh, Christine and you, uh, 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 and, uh, and 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 so some people who ever can come early uh, can can set it up. So next uh, next week, yeah, I can be here early. Um, so. Let's say half an hour, uh, half an hour, or or something. Or yeah, that was 9:30. 9:30. So yeah, they fine. they will they will figure it out. Okay, man. Okay. Yep, yep. Joseph, thanks, uh, thanks so much. And uh, I think you just have to come here and solve the problem. Okay. I'll be there in about a month. <laughs> Very good. Thanks so much. All right. See you later. I move this for a second. I've gotten multiple emails from multiple people in this room, and I will say I know that this. Right, we're we ready ready to go. Is everybody ready? If you just nod nod your head. Yeah. Yeah, I see one head nod. I'm gonna go I'm gonna go with that one. Um we were talking about Benedict uh before you left. And so one of the documents I've given to you on Moodle is um a glimpse of the rule of Saint Benedict. You, have you has anyone ever heard of, of the Benedictine monastery or benedictine monks um, if you have and if you haven't that's what this is referring to any monk that would call themselves benedictine means that they follow this rule um, so I've got the um, I've got the document here up on the screen this is from the Moodle page it's called it's in the medieval section it's the Bedinson book and I just want to highlight uh, just one of these rules. So if you look at the right side of the page here, um, the XVI, let's see if I can zoom in a bit more. There we go. So it, it will get a little bit bigger in just a moment. Um, so Roman numeral 16, it says, how the divine office shall be said in the daytime. So this is the rule about um, the divine office refers to prayer. So how prayer should be said during the daytime. It says, as the prophet says, seven times in the day I do praise thee. This is, uh, I can't remember which prophet it is. I think it's in the Psalms. Yeah, it's in the Psalms. Um, the sacred number seven will thus be fulfilled by us if at lauds at the first, third, sixth, ninth hours and vesper time and the clumpatorium, we perform the duties of our service. For it is of these hours of the day that he said, seven times in the day do I praise thee. For concerning the night hours, the same prophet says, at midnight I arose to confess unto thee. Therefore, at these times, let us give thanks to our creator concerning the judgments of his righteousness that is, at matins, etc., at night, we will rise to confess him. So if you've ever had any experience with monastic way of living, prayer is very important. 
And so this particular rule is used by Benedict to say this is when we pray and how often we pray. So they would pray seven times during the day. Those times are listed. And they would pray again at midnight. So if you can imagine, every night at midnight, depending, it doesn't matter when you went to sleep, you would be waking up to say prayers. Your day as a monk is very ordered. It's structured. Again, this is to be contrary to uh, the world in which you live, a live of chaos, um, power struggles. And so the monastic life is very ordered. You know what to expect. You know what's expected of you. And uh, you don't see the slides. I see that. I see it on my screen on my screen. Um, do you still not see the slides? Hmm. That's odd. How about now? You're not seeing anything. Mm -hmm. You see it now. You should see a you should see a web page. Ah, so weird. Anyway, if you go to Moodle and you upload the document, um, or download the document, you'll be able to see it. Let's see here. Now, do you see a PowerPoint? Still don't see a PowerPoint. One. One of them works. But it's an old one. No, but it's a PowerPoint. <laughs> yeah, I'm back, to, I'm back to a PowerPoint now. Um, oh. I'll share screen again. We'll do it like this. Try it again. Still. You still don't see it? Some do, but we can look at the... Oh, now there it is, yep. Okay. Most of us have, have it. We can, yeah. we can just thing, look at it. One, one thing you can do is if you hover over the, the window, there's a change layout button. Um, and there's also... It's one with a few little, little squares, little rectangles. If you click on that one a few times... It will rearrange how you see everyone. And then another one next to the little video camera picture. It looks like a person looking inside of a mirror. If you click that one, that will change how you see yourself. And so you can get rid of yourself, which might enable you to see a different... I mean, so what I'm, I'm actually using two computers, so I can see what you see on this one. And then I can see my PowerPoint on that one. Um, so I don't understand why some of you don't see it. Um, I'll tell you what I will do. I'll put it on Moodle now. And so if you're, if you're unable to see the PowerPoint, then you can go to Moodle in about two seconds. And you can view the PowerPoint there. So you, if you can't see the screen, I'm uploading it now. So there you go. If you can't see my PowerPoint, go to Moodle and go to the session two and take a look at it there. You can look at your neighbor to find out where I am. Where I am. Okay, I'm going to move on um, because we really do need to move on. We've only got about 25 minutes. Um, so we've looked at, at Benedictine monasticism. 
And one of the reasons why monasticism grew and spread uh, in popularity is because when you have this power vacuum, when you have a, chaos, a world of chaos, um, the monastic way of living brings order to that chaos. It brings safety, protection, and it brings uh, guidance, direction, education. Um, this is a time when people are uneducated. Um, you don't have schools like we have today. So the only people who are learning are those who are in the church hierarchy, um, those who are monks, and on occasion those who are in the nobility, um, the, the rich people, the powerful people. Um, I'm going to skip a few slides, and I'm going to go to... <laughs> I'll, I'll go to this one really quickly. Um, it's slide number 30. You see Luke Skywalker there. Um, he'll pop up here in a minute. If any of you are Star Wars fans um, and seen the most recent Star Wars, there is, uh, at the very end of the film, um, there's an island where Luke Skywalker is. That actually is a a monastic uh, commune of the medieval world. Um, so these stone structures here, these stone buildings, it's called Michael Skellig, and it's just off the um, western coast of Ireland. It's an island there, and it was used for monks to go and isolate themselves and dedicate themselves to prayer. So I thought that was kind of funny, because as I was watching Star Wars in the very end, this popped up. I'm like, hey, I've got that in my lecture. So I figured I would uh, get get a little Luke Skywalker and put him on there. Um <clears throat> Let's see here. I do need to mention this really quickly. Sorry, there's so much material in this one. Um, because monks were educated, they were learned in languages. And so one of the tasks of a monk was to memorize scripture and to write it down, to copy it down. So one of the reasons why we have the biblical text is because of monks who... Uh, spent hours and hours and days and days and years and years copying down the Bible. Because, again, at this time you don't have the printing press. The only way that you can uh, preserve writing is if it was kept safe and kept protected, or you had to copy out. And um, one of the things that uh, monks were known for is making beautiful versions of the Bible. Um, if you ever get a chance to go to Dublin, there is a library called uh, Trinity Library Dublin, and in the basement of this library is a copy of what's called the Book of Kells, and this is one of the faceplates of the Book of Kells, and this is a picture of the library itself. Um, it's uh, slide number 34 if you're looking at the PowerPoint itself. Um, Anyway, they used images, they used drawings to help explain and describe what was going on in the text. Um, really, really fascinating. There's a couple of key ones that were put together in this country, the Book of Kells and the Lindisfarne Gospels. There's a copy of the Book of Kells in Dublin and a copy of the Lindisfarne Gospels in the British Library in London. Um, I mentioned Bede, but we don't have time to look at him. We're going to move forward just a little bit. Yeah. I'm on slide number 42, if you're looking at a PowerPoint. Membership and function of the church in the medieval period. Um, so the Middle Ages were responsible for a good deal of clarification of the concept of what we call a sacrament. Um, we talked a little bit about baptism and Lord's Supper in the early church, and there's a lot more information in the notes. Um, the sacrament became um, a concept that was developed in the medieval period um, to mean more than a pledge, which is what the Latin understanding was in the uh, Roman world. It was a pledge, your allegiance to um, the emperor or to your military leader. Um, but in the church, it was a pledge, obviously, to the one true king, Jesus. 
Um, well, in the Middle Ages are responsible for a great deal of clarification of the concept of a sacrament. The word really means mystery, but there emerged a much stronger doctrine that the sacraments were necessary to salvation. And we can attribute a lot of this to Augustine and how he described sacraments, both baptism and the Lord's Supper. Um, there were a number of other ones which we may get to, we may not. Um, but in particular, what it meant was these are physical signs that um, through which God's grace comes to us. And which means if you don't participate in these things, then God's grace doesn't come to you. What emerged was an exclusivity of God's grace to the sacrament. So the only way you could get grace of God, the only way you could get love of God, the only way you could get, get the gifts of God is if you participate in the sacrament, in these mysteries. And you'll see how that becomes problematic as we move towards the Reformation. Um, it's a key issue that was being raised. So Mass, as uh, Roman worship was known as, became a cultic event which communicated grace objectively. The Mass was celebrated for the people, but not with the people. The priest began, was understood to be the mediator of grace, and so his role was emphasized. No longer are we meeting in homes. No longer are we just an underground movement where we gather together around a table. We are now part of the establishment. We are now um, uh, a part of the structures of the world, and our worship starts to reflect that. Um, our uh, power structures start to reflect that. And so priests, having this understanding of a sacrament as the channel through which God's grace comes to the people, and only priests could celebrate this thing, priests and bishops now become power brokers in terms of God's grace. They become the connecting point. And that's literally what a priest means, um, a connecting point between the people and God. And what emerged is a practice where the... Uh, priests would celebrate the sacraments on behalf of the people. Um, and so by the end of the, of the High Middle Ages, you have priests who are facing the wall, uh, facing the altar, and taking the sacrament themselves, and the people are far removed watching this event take place. Now remember, these are people who are not literate. They don't know Latin in terms of the scriptures being read or the prayers being said. They just hear them being said and being read and they trust that their priests are doing proper things. Um, and so these mysteries that they can't understand simply because they're illiterate and, and, and have no knowledge of what's going on and don't have a Bible on their own, can't read it anyway if they did have a Bible on their own, the priesthood, the clergy, then begins to see themselves as removed from the people and they become a connecting point between the people and God, and they begin to celebrate, in particular, the Lord's Supper um, by themselves on behalf of this. It's, if you think of the Old Testament, um, how priests would go on behalf of the people, they represented the people, and would connect the people to God, it's a similar way that medieval Christianity began to develop their understanding of the sacraments, um, that the people were removed, and there was a connecting point, which was the priest. It just simply means the priest began to uh, gain a lot of power in terms of people's relationship with God. Um, very significant point in the life of the church is the next slide. It's the spread of Islam. Uh, you see the dates there. I said it only took about 100 years to really see Islam spread across northern Africa and um, the Middle East. And so you see the dates there, 622 to 750. Um, if you don't know much about uh, Islam, there's plenty more in the notes, but I'm going to read just a little bit for you. Um, it's really important to understand their history um, if we want to understand how they think and uh, where their theology comes from. Um, you may or may not have some Muslim friends. Um, if you do, please do you know read for yourself, ask them questions, learn about the faith, um, because there's a lot of misunderstandings and misconceptions about um, both the beginnings, the origins of Islam, and the scriptures of both Islam and, and Christians. Um, we all claim the three main religions, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam, all claim to be Abrahamic, which means we all look to Abraham um, in Genesis as our 
like our, our father um and so our main understanding of god's relationship to humanity comes through abraham but anyway just to begin with muhammad um so muhammad died in 632 and within 100 years his followers had conquered uh, most of what you see there on the map um let's see here he gained some okay um he was born about 570 in mecca um you should be able to see mecca on that map there in saudi arabia, modern day saudi arabia so he was born in mecca and at some point at age 40 according to tradition uh, he felt a call to preach the message of a single transcendent god gaining some converts he felt that opposition to the uh in mecca required him to leave so he um went um to medina and medina is a, a city just north of where mecca is you can see it on the map the resulting so-called constitution of medina so he he went to Medeva, medina found some converts and basically became the leader of the town of medina the refusal of the jews uh, sorry uh, it brought peace to Medina and converts to Muhammad, although Jewish groups were to suffer. The refusal of Jews to follow the religion of Muhammad, it is said, led the Prophet to cease facing Jerusalem during prayer and begin facing Mecca. In 630, he and his followers marched to Mecca, and the Meccans uh, capitulated with little resistance. So he was kicked out of Mecca, went to Medina, became the leader of Medina, went back to Mecca, and took over the city. Mecca became then what it is today. It's the spiritual center of Islam, its holiest place, the center of pilgrimage, and the Kaaba, which is uh, the key uh, holy place in Mecca, became the great greatest shrine of Islam. And in 632, Muhammad died at Medina. And the key thing is, in the Muslim faith, in order to be a Muslim, you have to say this and believe it, that there's no God but Allah, and Muhammad is his prophet. That's the key thing. Muhammad received a revelation from God, and that's what now we see is the Quran. He is the final prophet. Um, Jesus is uh, is listed in in the Quran. We know a little bit about Jesus in the Quran. He's called Isa, and he's born of a virgin uh, in the Quran, uh, which is really fascinating. Um, he is a prophet. He did have some some helpful teachings. Um, he uh, he didn't die on a cross. There, there's belief within uh, Islam that says Jesus didn't die on a cross, which is really interesting um, because there's plenty of evidence to say that he he did. Um, the Quran, to the Muslim, the Quran was not written by Muhammad. He was merely the voice that recited. Quran literally means recitation. Um, the word of God was revealed to him by the angel Gabriel, who we see in the Bible as well. Um, in trance-like states, it was said Muhammad spoke and his words were written down uh, by other people who were with him on whatever that uh, whatever they had. Um, therefore, memorizing the Quran, uh, because Quran means recitation, is really important. Um, it has to be in Arabic. It can only be in Arabic if it's to be the true Quran. And it has to be literally transmitted through time. Now... There are about, I think, a million, the last I saw, there's about a million people, uh, Muslims in the world, who can recite the whole of the Quran. Um, and this is very important because for the Quran to be the Quran, it has to be word for word exactly as God had given it through Gabriel to Muhammad. And so there are a million people around the world who actually have memorized the whole of the Quran. It's really important. Um, you may find in the Christian church some people who feel the same way about the Bible, that the Bible has to be word for word, exactly as God had intended it. But the Bible is a very different...
Hello? Sorry, that was me. Can you guys hear me? I'm going to... Share screen. Go. Can you hear me? Can you see me? Yeah. Sorry, I got kicked off. Somebody else just used my login name, um, so so I had to I had to jump in here again. Anyway, the Quran. You might have some people um, in in your churches or in your Christian experience who say the Bible needs to be understood word for word. I know coming from where I come from, there's a particular version of the Bible that people like to use. And if you use anything that contradicts that version, then you got problems and it's not the real Bible. Well, you can do that with the Quran because there's only one person wrote one thing down and it was uh, transmitted as it is for a thousand years or more. Whereas the Bible is completely different. The Bible is written over a long period of time by a large number of different writers in three different languages, and it's a collection of books. So the Bible's uh, uh, comprising and its transmission to us today is a very different story. And Muslims struggle with this one, um, and you can see why, because their holy book is, is a specific version with a specific um, way of understanding and transmitting it. Um, really important stuff. Um, going to move on to, well, Islam uh, literally means submission, if you didn't know that. Um, that's what it actually means. You submit to God. Um, the word uh, jihad, which I'm sure you heard of in the news, um, is um, it's controversial, of course, um, but it's, it's, it's synonymous with the, the word holy war. Verses from the Quran, found in the Quran, uh, do support that meaning. For example, fight those who do not believe in God and in the last day, and who do not uh, forbid what God and his messenger have forbidden, and obey not the unbelievers, but struggle with them mightily. Now, this is something that uh, Muhammad pushed and the caliphate, so the leaders after him, uh, pushed. And as you can see, for the first hundred years of Islam, it really did spread. And it was because violence was the way forward. Um, you go into a new town, you uh, spread the message of Islam, and if they didn't uh, agree, then you were allowed to, you, you either told them to leave, um, or you there would be violent consequences. And that's one of the reasons why Islam spread. Um, let's see, do I have another map here? I'm on the wrong computer, yeah. Um, I can't actually see, I'm using a different system now. Right, so we're moving into the Byzantine Empire. We don't have talk. I'll, I'll do a, a mini lecture on Eastern Christianity here in a little while today. Um, let's move forward. There's Justinian. If has any of you been to Istanbul? Um, if you have, you will have seen this. If you haven't, and you get a chance, go. This is called Hagia Sophia, and the Emperor Justinian, the sixth century who was the emperor in the in the east in Constantinople decided that he would build the largest church in Christendom and he would build it in Constantinople the new capital in the east Constantine city and this is what he has done and so Hagia Sophia which you see there I think if I have another one there's the inside became the largest church in Christendom and Hagia Sophia is called the Holy Wisdom, is what that means. Um, it is said that when he walked inside at its consecration at the first uh, meeting in the building, he walks in, he looks up and he says, Solomon, I have surpassed thee. So he's talking about King Solomon and his temple and what he had built. Now he claims is much better than Solomon. Don't know if you can see it or not, but... 
in the up in the corner there in one of those dome looking things you see a figure I'll zoom in who is that that's Mary and Jesus okay now this building is now a uh, well it became a mosque once Islam conquered that part of the uh, Christendom um, now it's a museum but as you can see in that former shot there are um, you know Arabic words around and its shapes and design like like a mosque but this remains and the reason or what it what it does is it tells us a little bit about what that building was designed to do it was designed as a Christian church um, and so you've got Theotokos Mary the mother of God with the baby Jesus still up in the uh, one of the domes there um, gonna move forward a little bit so we don't have time to talk about that um, I'll mention this and then and then we'll finish. Um, icons. Now I don't know what your experience is with with Eastern Christianity or with icons or iconography. This is John of Damascus, seventh uh, or eighth, and um, where, where am I at here? Those dates are wrong. He is not that old. <laughs> 660 to 850. He's not 190 years old. Um, anyway, I'll get that corrected. Anyway, he um, wrote a defense of the use of icons. And these icons are, are paintings of biblical scenes or figures in Christianity. And um, many people were, were challenging the use of these things because of the commandment that says you should have no graven images so no images no statues or anything and what he just what he described in his book on the defense of the divine images um is he talks about them as um, windows of heaven you may have heard that phrase before icons are windows of heaven they're glimpses of heaven they're glimpses of the saints who have gone before and they teach us things and they um uh they are ways in which we can uh, remember those who have gone before and there are also ways in which we can pray um, we can learn from the saints who have gone before and I might talk about him uh, in, a, in a later lecture I think I'm going to stop there um, let me make my screen big again stop sharing right uh, I think I'm going to stop there uh, sorry for the the technical issues today um, I think I'll write an email to all of you and just explain step by step the, the way that we, that we do it here and see if that helps for next week. I will be online half an hour before um, next week. Can I just encourage you um, throughout the week? Again, I'll do some, some mini lectures on some of the things we didn't cover. Um, I'm going to share my screen again. And uh, just to say that if you can have a read through the notes, which I will put up shortly, and the readings that I do have that I managed to get up there, I'll try to get those other readings on from the early church section. But as you're reading through, um, please think of at least one question that you might have and go on the forum here, which somebody's already done. And uh, it's very simple. Add a new discussion topic. Title it whatever you want. Write your question or your comment, and then I can reply. And others, if you want to join in to the conversation, you can reply. I'd also mention um, the office hours. So on Wednesdays from 10 to 11 your time, I've got my chat box open. So if anybody wants to have a chat, um, it's a public forum. Anybody can join in if you have any questions about the reading or the class or the material or anything like that. Then feel free to jump in on that one on a Wednesday. Um, 
sorry we didn't get a lot of time for questions. We we were a bit screwed with uh, <laughs> with our time today. But uh, anyway, if you do have questions about medieval stuff, put it in the forum, and we will we will chat that way. And then again, I'll I'll do some videos for you. But thanks for your attention. I'll put the link to this recording up. So if there's any point that um, it wasn't a good connection, you'll be able to at least see me. And if you missed anything, if you want to watch back, I'll put that link up on Moodle as well. But uh, anyway, hope you guys have a great day. And uh, I'll see you next week. Bye.